that time figure. Well, the timing is off. It's uh, 10 after, but uh, I was on time for the song. My DJ skills are, are believe, don't do it. You'll make me lose my composure. That funny is horrifically funny. Folks, we had, you know, it's been an awesome day. It's been an awesome day. And uh, I, I tell you what, if you guys missed the broadcast from the uh, coming apocalypse this morning, the substance of that broadcast was so incredibly filled with a newness of spirit. It was just overwhelming and incredible. And I believe that uh, when you go back and if you listen to it again, you can actually stir up your internal spirit yet again. Uh, and it was just an awesome experience. Awesome experience. So if you get a chance, uh, go back and revisit that. Uh, you know how you listen to things more than once? And you begin to capture things out of what was said, things that were conveyed. Uh, if you listen very closely, uh, you'll hear both promises, a few nudges, but most of all, you'll certainly feel the love of the Father directed towards you, coming upon you. It was such an atmosphere of love in that room. It was just overwhelming. Overwhelming. Thank you all for visiting us tonight. And again, we are going through the book of Jeremiah here at the Council of Time. This is a uh, somewhat of a study because we're attempting to identify something, something that has been covered up for a very long time, and um, I I'm likely not the only one with these revelations. I'm not saying that I'm right by any means because we're reading the Word of God, and whatever God has declared, it's, it's settled. That's what it is. But the Lord is certainly giving his children insight into their lives so that we can be serious and sober in our walk. We need to be serious and sober. Now, the book of Jeremiah, as we go through the book of Jeremiah, it takes your maturity. Wherever you are, it takes your maturity to take in these words, not be biased when listening to the words of our Lord. You see, if you're biased, what happens when you're biased? If you're biased in any way and your soul is not absolutely open to the truth of our Lord, what happens is you begin to lean one way or the other. And if you lean one way, you're going to miss what was on the other side. And if you lean that way, you're going to miss what was on the former side. And so if you're not biased, if you're listening to learn who the Lord is, you'll capture the full story. If you're going to use it for ammunition, for deceitful purposes, to gain knowledge so that you can say, I have something over somebody else, it won't last within you. It will effectively be uprooted in you and then turn vile. And you don't want to be a, ves a, a vessel of destruction among your brothers and sisters. Be a vessel of usage, a vessel of usage. We began yesterday, we read through Jeremiah 1, Jeremiah 2. We're going through Jeremiah 3, but we need to recap on Jeremiah chapter 1. Now, chapter 1, although it's, uh, most people would say there's no substance in Jeremiah 1, I beg to differ, because number one, it conveys to us your sense of purpose as a vessel of usage. Jeremiah was called not being, Jeremiah was not, Within, by his own words, by his own words, he basically told the Lord he was not capable. He was not learned enough to do what the Lord asked him to do. And the Lord said, don't say that. Don't say you speak as a child. And then the Lord did touch his mouth, placing his words within his mouth. Now, Jeremiah was to face an enemy, just like the Lord said, I send you sheep among wolves. He told Jeremiah, he has made him a defensed city and an iron pillar and a brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, those, those who he had to go to, the kings of Judah and the princes that were in Judah, and against the priests and against the people of the land. And the Lord told him, they shall fight against you, Jeremiah, but they will not prevail against you, Jeremiah. The Lord said, for I am with you. 
the Lord will deliver him. The Lord said he will deliver him. You know, in a like manner, he does call us in our respective positions with him. In our predestined walk to do the same thing. He did not send us sheep among hamsters. But he sent us sheep among wolves for the sake of his word. For the sake of our brothers and sisters that are out there. The word that, I, I tell you what, Jeremiah is so rich in content. It is so incredibly rich in content. It can overwhelm. It really can. But in a good way. Because I can almost guarantee that you'll want to look deeper into the book of Jeremiah. I can almost see with some of you, you're going to hear key phrases you've heard before. It's going to spark an interest it's going to draw you into that book. And I think it's beautiful. And a lot of people would say, well, what does the book of Jeremiah have to do with us? We know there are prophecies in there, but how is that helping my walk? Well, in one respect, it helps to identify you. We discussed yesterday, we were talking about the whore of Babylon, which within itself is a mystery, mystery Babylon. You remember? Mystery Babylon. Now, you know what? You have to ask yourself, and I want you to contemplate this right now. First of all, why in the world would the Lord call a place Mystery Babylon in the first place? Why would he say that? Mystery Babylon. And why in the world would she have great mother of harlots on her forehead and the abominations of the earth? You also hear terms when it comes to her destruction like daughter of Babylon. Right? You hear that? Babylon and daughter of Babylon. You see, that begins to throw people off. Correct? Has that ever thrown any of you off? When you read and it says, Babylon and then daughter of Babylon, old daughter of Babylon. You read that, right? Does that throw anybody off? It's from Revelation, by the way. Here's the deal. We've heard Pastor Paul say he thinks that Bab- mystery Babylon is America in parties, right? He's right. We've heard and we see the descriptions that part of Babylon, mystery Babylon, hangs around in Israel. That's partly right. What you didn't know is that what mystery Babylon is clothed with are people like us. You see, we have become the jewels of this harlot that sits atop the beast. And it's all made very clear. If we look into the Word of God without bias, to seek His face, to seek Him, to know our Father in Heaven, you'll begin to learn His ways, certainly through the book of Jeremiah. Because any time He speaks to a prophet, someone He has called, He reveals Himself what He's pleased with, what He's not pleased with. He reveals His plans, which are not hidden plans. That's why He sent prophets. The Lord didn't hide his plans. He sent prophets. But these terms in Revelation concerning, and and there are some keynotes. I want you to take note of this in Revelation before we continue with Jeremiah. It's very important. Very insightful. Very insightful. I want you to understand this. Revelation 18, 24, number one, and in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. That's quite a confusing term because, you know, Jerusalem was described as a place where the blood of the prophets were, right? Jerusalem was. But this is, and of the saints, and of all that were slain upon the earth. Make a note of Revelation 18.24. Also, make a note of Revelation 18.23. In the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom And the voice of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. Make a note of that. That's Revelation 18.23. I'll tell you why. It's also found in Jeremiah 7.34. Where the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will be heard no more in her. It's also in Jeremiah 16. Make a note of that. Make a note. Please make a note of that. Make a note. Now... Concerning this Babylon is talking about merchants of the earth and merchandise, right? 
that's also defined in the book of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah. Merchandise may not be what you think. May not be what you think. You see, in Revelation 18:9 it says, And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her shall bewail her and limit for her, when they shall see the smoke of her burning. They committed fornication. How can you commit, how can one nation commit fornication with another? Have you ever asked yourself that question? How can that be? How can that be? You see, in order to fornicate, you have to be married, right? You, if, if you're a harlot, in this context, looking up the original words, is the act of a married person is, is called an adulteress who willingly does it with more than one partner. But she has to be married first. She has to be married. Now that is defined by some of you who've looked into the Bible. You say, yeah, I saw that before because Israel is married, right? Israel's married. And God often referred to her as his wife, but that God also called her a harlot because she went out and adopted everything else with every other nation. But Babylon does not make sense to call her Babylon. Well, we're going to look at that tonight, too. It's right there in the Word of God. It's in the Word of God. But it's a little expansive. It's more expansive than what you think. And there's a reason mystery is put upon our heads. You see, if it, it's obvious. Let me tell you something. It's obvious that the United States would be a type of Babylon because we have all its practices. It's obvious, right, that America would be. It's obvious that certain nations would be a Babylon, but this is mystery Babylon. And it's the great mother of harlots. It is the great mother, which means it's the original harlot. The great mother of harlots is the original harlot and abominations of the earth. So it's the mother, the great mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots is in fact the first harlot. You guys got that? That's, that's pretty simple. It's right there in front of us. Right there in front of us. So it's a little more expansive, but what people don't know is that they too, some of them, who call themselves being in the body of Christ, are part of this harlot. See, that's, that is the disturbing part. They're part of this harlot. They are part of this harlot. The flesh does not identify you. What resides within a person identifies them. The truth of an individual is internal, not external. Some of you who have come to Christ through tattoos and earrings and piercings and all this good, 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 that and the other, it does not identify you. What's inside of you identifies you. What's inside? That's very important to remember. Now let's all be sober as we're going through the books of Jeremiah. Let's not take offense and let's understand something that Israel is God's business. That is so very important for all of us to understand. Don't dare take a side against your brothers and sisters. Or you're going to find yourself with the same fate that's described in the books of Jeremiah. And the reason why I say that is because the fate described in the book of Jeremiah is also described in Revelation. It will absolutely happen. And the Lord will not be pacified until his indignation is complete. He will not be pacified until his indignation is complete. He's not. Which means it's still yet to happen. You see, his indignation, his wrath is complete after the days of wrath. That's what the day of the Lord is for. That is his wrath. The day of the Lord is his wrath. He's not going to be pacified, and that's already written, until all this takes place. 
So by context, we know that some of this has not happened yet. Also by context, we know that something is being identified because something happened to the people. I'm submitting to you right now, something has also happened to those inside the body of Christ. And if you're toying with your salvation, God's mercy be upon you. But I don't know how long those petitions will last according to each and every individual who's toying with their salvation. There's no guarantee of time that your life will be perpetuated. The plagues are being released. Do you hear me? The plagues are being released. The heavens will be disturbed. But before that, mankind will be disturbed. You will be confronted by the enemy as a process of absolute deliverance the enemy will confront the leadership then the people will witness the confrontations of confrontations the plagues the heavens these are processes God established God established these processes. And we're going to learn that he's not going to withdraw his processes. Okay, so what we're going to do, because we read one and two. Oh, and in chapter two, something else you should have written down last night. Uh, Jeremiah 2, 3. Israel was holiness unto the Lord and the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend, evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. The land was his first fruits. The land was holiness. You guys got that? Darren begins the controversy. The land was. He adopted, cleaned up and adopted, and washed thoroughly the inhabitants before their deliverance. But the land was his. And what did they do? What did they do? He said, I bought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made my inheritance an abomination. His land is the key here. That's why parting his land is so very foolish. And But you know what? They have parted his land. They already have done that. That's why in the word it says, and they will part, they will part my land no more. And when they parted the land, they effectively opened up a type of curse in that land. That's why they had no peace. God never declared peace upon Israel. We're going to learn that too. He didn't declare peace. He said, if they did this or did that, he would do this and do that. But if they didn't, their problems would perpetuate. And their problems have perpetuated. The Lord could have made, and we're going to learn this too, He could have made a swift end to all her enemies. You see, the entire earth could have been healed through her. Just as a land can be healed through its people. The Lord said, if my people humble themselves in prayer, I will turn and heal the land. Had Israel done the right thing, turned back unto him, boom. Now I have a question for you. Are the people defined by the leadership of a country? No, they're not. No, they are not. The people are not defined by the leadership of a nation. I'm talking about you. You're not defined by the White House. You're not. Oh, and so we're also going to talk about Baal. Why in the world Baal is used? Why were these people doing things to Baal? Can I, let me have your ear for a minute. Baal, Baal comes from the Babylonian creation text that deity did, which contained Murdoch, Murdoch, Marduk. Some people call him Marduk, Murdoch, or whatever. And guess what he is? 
forces. He is the God of the forces of order. Well, there was another one in the text, and guess who he was? Tiamat. Guess who Tiamat was? The God of the forces that threaten human existence. So you have two forces. They did worship. All coming from the same entity. Baal. Same entity. And he will worship a God his fathers knew not. He will worship the God of forces. Interesting. He will worship the God of forces. A God that his fathers knew not. A God that his fathers knew not. A God that his fathers knew not. God that his fathers knew not. Baal is actually not just Mars. Baal is a category, it categorizes. Baal categorizes a set of deities who were a principality, who governed the air. Marduk actually was also the sun god. See, they had so many different names, and these different cultures took them and changed them and made them what they want. But the Sumerian text, being the oldest they ever found, things stemmed from these, this false worship of these false gods. Actually, they worshipped the fallen angels. You see, the fallen angels were here for a very long time, extremely long time. And they did establish themselves, and the Sumerians wrote all about it because they worshipped them. And then that was given to the entire earth. Egypt is not the oldest civilization on the earth. It's not. And then what they did was they took the, the fallen angels' stories and their worship of them, and then, of course, men added their creativity to it, changed the names, languages changed, and then the lies were put in, and then everything was lost. And so that's why only by the Spirit of the Most High which is the Holy Spirit, because you ever hope to know the truth. Because you're not going to find the truth from any book that you read. It's tainted. You see, if you perpetuate one lie for four generations, the fourth generation only knows it as what? Truth. As fact, it's truth. Well, if it's founded on a lie, the entire text is no good. See how that works? And so you can only trust the Spirit of the Most High, who will give you truth. But I submit to you right now, a man who hates God, writing about ancient history, who then publishes a book and gives it to everybody, you can't read that book as truth. You're not going to find the truth there. The same process also happened in Jeremiah. 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 So we're going to read this. We're going to hear. We're going to listen to Jeremiah chapter 3. Right now, we're going to listen to it, Jeremiah chapter 3. So keep your minds open. Remember, don't listen to it as a biased child of the Most High, but open your ears, your spiritual ears, to the truth of the Word, to the truth of the Word. And here we go as soon as I push the right button. You guys let me know if I don't push the right button. Jeremiah 3. They say, If a man put away his wife, and she go from him, and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers. Yet return again to me, saith the Lord. Lift up thine eyes unto the high places, and see where thou hast not been lain with. In the ways hast thou sat for them, as the Arabian in the wilderness, and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms, and with thy wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain. And thou hast a whore's forehead, thou refusedst to be ashamed. Wilt thou not from this time cry unto me, My father, thou art the guide of my youth? Will he reserve his anger for ever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, thou hast spoken, and done evil things as thou couldst. 
The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain, and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. And I said after she had done all these things, Turn thou unto me. But she returned not, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw, when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away, and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. And it came to pass through the likeness of her whoredom, that she defiled the land, and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. And yet for all this her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly, saith the Lord. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Go, and proclaim these words toward the north, and say, Return, thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger for ever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree. And ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And it shall come to pass, when ye be multiplied and increased in the land, in those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mine, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done any more. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. In those days the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. But I said, how shall I put thee among the children, and give thee a pleasant land, a goodly heritage of the hosts of nations? And I said, Thou shalt call me my father, and shalt not turn away from me. Surely as a wife treacherously departed from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. A voice was heard upon the high places, weeping, and supplications of the children of Israel, for they have perverted their way, and they have forgotten the Lord their God. Return, ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills, and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. For shame hath devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. We lie down in our shame, and our confusion covereth us, for we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers, from our youth even unto this day, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. Technical difficulties at its best, the whole thing dropped out. Don't worry, I'm back. They can't get rid of me that easily. That was the uh, mic from around the world slash button pusher. Can't push the wrong button. Folks, anyway, chapter three, very informative chapter. Are you guys starting to, by listening to uh, chapter three, are you beginning to get an idea of the Lord's heart concerning his land and his people that dwell in the land. Are you beginning to sense his heart concerning that? You know, when you listen to that chapter, think of yourself as a son or daughter in that predicament. 
and he sent another son or daughter to go talk to you. Right? And when a father is very concerned, listen to me, when he's very concerned, that's when he says the things that he says. Now we have to remember, God is a God of love, but he does not lie. Every word that's released out of his mouth is finite. It happens. It takes place. He does not desire that anyone die outside of him, meaning he does not want his children lost. But understand that he gave Israel everything. He gave them everything. In fact, as we continue to read through Jeremiah, we're going to see the description of Israel, of what the Lord intended it to be. Something happened to the people. He talks a lot about she had a whore's forehead. She's not so good forehead. Which means that's an announcement, folks, of her intentions. That's a mark that she had upon her head. It's a mark she had upon her head. Her forehead means, it literally means, if you look it up, means clearly seen. Attracting notice or attention, but clearly seen. Clearly seen. Now keep in mind, Revelation 18, through her fornication, through her fornication, they waxed rich through her fornication. Can I just give a little teaser here? This is just a little teaser here. Before you jump off the seat and say, yep, that's definitely Israel, you need to, we really have to go through the rest of the books of Jeremiah, but understand something. When God gives or empowers or gives anybody something of promise and they go and corrupt it, they have it effectively become a harlot to him. They have turned away from him. This same chapter, Jeremiah 3, happened again. It happened again. You know when they when he says she has created or, or she has played the harlot and she has many lovers and this, that, and the other. What she did was that she had everything from God first, directly from God first. And then she began to adopt the ways of the lands she lived in. She began to practice the ways, accepting the ways, willingly as accepting the ways of the land she's placed in. You know what's scary about that? This is scary. This is scary about this. Listen, the Lord said, you're in this world, not of this world. Uh-oh. He said, you are in this world, not of this world. Uh-oh. He didn't say, uh-oh. I'm saying, uh-oh. Uh-oh. You know, we kind of sound like Israel. We do sound like the occupants of Israel. We're in this world, not of this world. He did not place us in this world to adopt every way that mankind devises and creates. He did not place us in this world to esteem idols made by men's hands above him. He did not do that. We're in this world, not of this world. He too placed us in a place where we were not to be partakers. You know what? He actually said this. He said to love the world is to have enmity with God. That is a fierce separation from God. Uh-oh. Oh, boy. Can you say... I'm beginning to appreciate my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you the truth. The more understanding I have in the Word of God, the more I fall to my knees and thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, even more. Because when you absolutely understand 
that you messed it all up? That your parents messed it all up? And you understand that you are absolutely 100% condemned because you messed it all up? And then God sends His Son as the final sacrifice and you're now covered by the blood of the Lamb simply by saying, yes, I do believe. And something that bears witness in your soul wasn't hard for you to say you believe because it bared witness in your soul. And when you understand the Lord's heart concerning those who have turned against Him, who have backstabbed the living God, and we too backstabbed the living God in our ignorance, you begin to appreciate the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because, see, you begin to realize something that of all things you deserve, we all deserve death, not life. But He gave us life everlasting through His Son, Jesus Christ. The more understanding I have, the more I realize just how important and how loving the Father was to reclaim His children. Hence the term redeemed. We're going to hear that term too. We heard that today. Redeemed from absolute total separation. Redeemed from death. Eternal death. Oh boy. All I can say is oh boy to that one. I'm going to try and stay calm. So chapter 3, we've read a great many things. We understand that right now, the Lord said in Jeremiah 3.3, 3, Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain. That's terrible. There hath been no latter rain, and thou hast a whore's forehead. And not only that, they refuse to be ashamed. They're justifying their actions. Does that sound familiar? Now, I want you to place yourself as we read through Jeremiah to understand that whatever Israel will go through physically, you too are in a subjection spiritually to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. You are not separated from his people. You are his people. You're in this world, not of this world. And if you're not of this world, you are his people. He called you out of the world, made you holy from the world. He separated you from the world. You're his people. Try right, craft it into the branch. And if in Romans 28, it says, A Jew is not a Jew outwardly, but in fact is a Jew inwardly, then what are you? You see, you're no longer what you used to be. You're not a heathen anymore. You're not a heathen anymore. You are grafted into the brine. So let me tell you something. If you, if you see a person with a skin graft, you can't take that skin off. You can't take it off. You can't take that skin off. If you're grafted into the branch... You are intertwined, made permanent to that branch. So then, what are you? What are you? Maybe you're not what you think you are. I'll tell you this. If you accepted your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who above his head was written King of the Jews, then what are you? What are you? He is King of kings and Lord of lords. And you're grafted into the branch. You're made a permanent fixture. Permanent. Let me calm down. Let me calm down. Jeremiah 3, nine, And it came to pass through the likeness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. And yet for all this her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but vainly saith the Lord. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. You know what? I'm getting the feeling that the Lord does not like us to justify ourselves, does he? 
Have you ever noticed that when you are doing something, listen, in our old days, when you were a kid and you were doing something wrong and you were caught doing something wrong and you looked at your parents and said, no, it wasn't me, right? You ever do that? You like that? Impersonation. No, it wasn't me. You're justifying yourself. Well, I had to do that because of this, that, and the other. I I'm getting the feeling that the Lord stands against that. He called us to be people of integrity. We don't justify anything. You know who our justifier is? He is. He justifies us. He does, not us. We need not justify. We're going to learn more about that as we go through this book. But you justified. And the Lord said something very important. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. I will take you one of a city, two of a family. I will bring you to Zion. This is God's heart concerning his children. After they were in a corrupt state, this is his heart concerning his children. No wonder he sent the Savior. This is his heart concerning the children. And then he said, what if she turns back? He will give her pastors according to his heart, which will feed them with knowledge and understanding. If they turned back. But as we go through Jeremiah 3, we understand. Jeremiah 3.20 Surely as a wife treacherously departeth from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house Israel, saith the Lord. Tragedy, folks. Absolute tragedy. Tragedy. Now, us, in a like manner, I want to say something before we go to chapter 4. Chapter 4 is a very meaty chapter. It will likely consume the rest of our time in discussion. But I want to ask you a question. For those who are not taking their salvation seriously and or taking it lightly, have we too become treacherous to the Father? Even with our Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, who grants us forgiveness of sins, have we been truthful with Him? This is not something you announce. Take it to your quiet place, your secret place. In other words, that's between you and Him. But I'm asking, pleading, as a brother of the body of Christ, who too was redeemed, I'm pleading, take it serious. Time itself is beginning to collapse in upon itself. And if our lips are saying one thing and our heart does not bear witness with what our mouth is saying, we're not speaking truth. If I say I love you and my heart is turned against you, I am lying. You may not know it, but I know it. But God certainly understands my thoughts. He searches the reins of my heart. And he knows it. There's nothing I can hide from him. There's no conversation that is secret from him. There is no thought hidden from him. I am open. To him. He knows exactly what I am. He knows if I am an open grave or if I am in fact full of salt. His salt that is for flavor in this earth. He knows exactly who I am. My integrity depends on my ability to speak truth to him. You see, because the end result is eternal life for eternal damnation. He doesn't want any of us in eternal damnation. Any of us. But this is something we have to be honest with Him about. With our ambitions. With everything. Be honest and open with Him. He is your Father. And in some ways, we have not turned back to Him. 
we still hide things from Him. We hide our secret desires from Him, but they're not hidden. If we are to be open to Him, He will be open in view of men to us. But if we hold secrets from Him, if we keep those things we know we're not supposed to have, those desires, those practices, if we keep things within ourselves that we have not opened up to Him, and it's so easy to say, Lord, look at this, what I'm dealing with. Help me with this. It's so easy to do that instead of closing off yourself and turning your back, saying, I have no problems, Lord, I have no problems. He's waiting for you to be honest with Him. We even have to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Not through repetition. Not through tradition. But spirit and in truth. It's time for us to be absolutely sober and real with our Lord. Now let's go to chapter... Well, well, yeah, let's go to chapter 4. I was about to say let's take a break, but evidently we already took one. So we're going to go to chapter 4. I'm not going to hit the wrong button. You guys uh, pray that I don't hit the right wrong button. Chapter 4, coming up, here we go. Jeremiah 4. If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me. And if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight... Then shalt thou not remove, and thou shalt swear, The Lord liveth in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness. And the nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire, and burn that none can quench it, because of the evil of your doings. Declare ye in Judah, and publish in Jerusalem, and say, Blow ye the trumpet in the land, cry, gather together, and say, Assemble yourselves, and let us go into the defensed cities. Set up the standard toward Zion, retire, stay not. For I will bring evil from the north and a great destruction. The lion has come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate, and thy city shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. For this gird you with sackcloth, lament and howl, for the fierce anger of the Lord is not turned back from us. And it shall come to pass at that day, saith the Lord, that the heart of the king shall perish, and the heart of the princes and the priests shall be astonished, and the prophets shall wonder. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, surely thou hast greatly deceived this people and Jerusalem, saying, Ye shall have peace, whereas the sword reacheth unto the soul. At that time shall it be said to this people and to Jerusalem, a dry wind of the high places in the wilderness toward the daughter of my people, not to fan, nor to cleanse. Even a full wind from those places shall come into me. Now also will I give sentence against them. Behold, he shall come up as clouds, and his chariots shall be as a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe unto us, for we are spoiled. O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness that thou mayest be saved. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? For a voice declareth from Dan, and publisheth affliction from Mount Ephraim. Make ye mention to the nations, Behold, publish against Jerusalem that watchers come from a far country, and give out their voice against the cities of Judah. As keepers of a field, are they against her round about? because she hath been rebellious against me, saith the Lord. Thy way and thy doings have procured these things unto thee. This is thy wickedness, because it is bitter, because it reacheth unto thine heart. My bowels, my bowels, I am pained in my very heart. My heart maketh a noise in me, 
I cannot hold my peace, because thou hast heard, O my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Destruction upon destruction is cried, for the whole land is spoiled. Suddenly are my tents spoiled, and my curtains in a moment. How long shall I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sottish children, and they have none understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form, and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord, and by his fierce anger. For thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black, because I have spoken it. I have purposed it, and will not repent, neither will I turn back from it. The whole city shall flee for the noise of the horsemen and bowmen. They shall go into thickets, and climb up upon the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken, and not a man dwell therein. And when thou art spoiled, what wilt thou do? Though thou clothest thyself with crimson, though thou deckest thee with ornaments of gold, Though thou rentest thy face with painting, in vain shalt thou make thyself fair. Thy lovers will despise thee. They will seek thy life. For I have heard a voice as of a woman in travail, and the anguish as of her that bringeth forth her first child, the voice of the daughter of Zion that bewaileth herself, that spreadeth her hands, saying, Woe is me now, for my soul is wearied because of murderers. That is one powerful chapter. You know what? Already a great many people will say, well, that happened back then. Oh, did it? Did it? Did the earth mourn back then? No. The earth did mourn. Were the heavens ashamed, which means they were gone? No. Did they, were they gone into captivity after all these things? Yes. But how many have studied what happened in the land of Babylon concerning Israel? Was the temple destroyed? Yes. But things were not fulfilled. And we're going to get to that. The Lord gave us a process. His word is rich. Very rich. But we're going to go back to the beginning because I tell you what. I tell you what. Destruction. Destruction and destruction. This chapter is about destruction. If they would return, but they didn't, they did not return. And if they would put away their abominations out of the sight of the Lord, but they didn't. And so this process carried on. And then they were told to blow the trumpet in the land, cry together and stay as some of yourselves and let us go into the defensed cities. Set up a standard toward Zion. Retire, comma, stay not. And the Lord said he will bring evil from the north, a great destruction. A great destruction. The destroyer, and in Jeremiah 4, 7, it says the lion is come up from his thicket. And the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. Let, let me put the brakes on right there. Now, he's talking about Israel. He's giving Israel, Judah, Jerusalem, a warning. Yet in the middle of it, he says the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. Where did that come from? Ladies and gentlemen, does that fit into the context of what we're reading? Then it says, He has gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate, and thy cities shall be laid waste without inhabitants. 
Listen, the cities will be laid waste without inhabitant. The destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. The Jeremiah 4 7, take a note of that. It's very important to remember. You see, because Jeremiah chapter 4 absolutely is spoken of in future books of the Bible, like the book of Joel. And what the Lord is doing, and I've noticed this, the Lord gives a prophecy, and the latter, the latter prophecies are defined in detail by the former prophecies. You see how we set that up so you have to dig and study and pray and search and dig and study and pray and search and dig and study and pray and search? I love it. I do absolutely love it. I love it. And then he says, For this gird you with sackcloth. Lament and howl, for the fierce anger of the Lord is not turned back from us. They're in the middle of something. He's telling them a prophecy when they are in the middle of something. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that the heart of the king shall perish, and the heart of the princes and the priests shall be astonished, and the prophets shall wonder. The prophets shall wonder. The prophets shall wonder. Then said I, this is Jeremiah, Ah, Lord God, surely thou hast greatly deceived this people and Jerusalem, saying, Ye shall have peace. Whereas the sword reacheth unto the soul. You see, someone told them they were going to have peace. God never said once. He gave them a promise that if they did certain things, they would have peace. Now we're reading in Jeremiah being sent to them to tell them these harsh sayings of which he said they would fight against him saying this. He gave us all a promise. He gave you a promise. He gave me a promise that if we did certain things, then he would respond accordingly. But they didn't do it. And here they just bust down to Jeremiah saying, Wait a minute, Lord, surely you're greatly deceived. You know, I could even make that statement. Say, Lord, you have deceived Jerusalem. Saying they're going to have peace. Right? Can you imagine someone talking to the Lord? And you say, wait a minute, Lord. You said they were, they were going to have peace. But the sword reaches them to their soul. They're taking over. You said they were going to have peace. You've deceived them. For Jeremiah, no wonder when the Lord touched his mouth. He had to touch his mouth for him to make this statement. Because I couldn't do it. I couldn't sit there and say, Lord, you, you, uh, you've deceived. Are you kidding? Not, no. But he did. Jeremiah did. You see what happens here? Don't you see this same? Listen, I, I submit to you today that this same process is happening. Let me tell you why. Because in Revelation it said the holy city will be trampled underfoot for 40 and two months. And you know what everybody else is saying? Nothing is going to touch Jerusalem. That's what they're saying. Nothing is going to touch Jerusalem. But clearly in Revelation it says, the holy city will be trampled underfoot for 40 and two months. And then it goes on to say, and he will wear out the saints of the Most High. Are you kidding? And here we hear Jeremiah saying, Wait a minute, God, you, you greatly deceived, and not, not just deceived, greatly deceived this people. And Jerusalem saying, you shall have peace. Can I tell you something? God has spoken. No, there's no statement in the Bible. No statement in the Bible that determined finitely that Israel would have peace until his wrath is complete. He never said it. How do we view this in context of what's happening today, honestly. Because that is somewhat deceptive, right? But let me tell you something. In the book of Isaiah, God said he will purge his vineyard. Whose vineyard? His. His vineyard. He's going to purge his vineyard. And all these fake individuals who point their finger at Israel are doing nothing more than drawing themselves out for the days of wrath. Hey, he's doing two things. 
I'll give you a spoiler. Not only is he going to purge his vineyard, his vineyard, because it's his, and he knows the intimate details of what they're doing. He's going to purge his vineyard. He's also going to draw out everybody by use of Israel. All the evil in the world, I'm telling you now, he's going to draw evil out of the world, draw them right around Israel. All these people you see pointing fingers at Israel, they have a destruction so bad that the world will absolutely halt when it takes place. But the Lord will purge his finger. May I remind you also, can I say something? In the book of Isaiah, when it said the Lord will purge his vineyard, we're talking about the latter days. If he purges his vineyard, I'm telling you now, whatever happens to Israel physically is going to happen to us spiritually. At the same time they're being purged, so will we. So will we be purged. So will we. Keep that in mind. And then it says in Jeremiah 4, 13, Behold, he shall come up as clouds, and his chariots shall be as a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe unto us, for we are spoiled. Anybody know what that word spoiled means? It equates or breaks down to being a prey. That's what it means, being a prey. You know, kind of like a, 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 a rabbit would be the prey of a leopard, Right? A rabbit would be the prey of a leopard. And it means ruin too. But in this specific context, the way that was translated, they are a prey. They are being hunted almost. They are a prey. A prey is spoiled. They are a prey. Then he says, O Jerusalem, was thine heart from wickedness that thou mayest be saved? How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? For the voice declareth from Dan and publish the affliction from Mount Ephraim. Make ye mention to the nations, to the nations, behold, publish against Jerusalem. Listen, that the watchers come from a far country and give out their voice against the cities of Judah. Let me let me let me stop right there. Because we can also find this in the book of Joel. They come from a Let's go to the book of Joel. Jeremiah 4.16. Jeremiah 4.16. It says that the watchers come from a far country and give out their voice against the cities of Judah. They give out their voice against the cities of Judah. The watchers give out their voice against the cities of Judah. Right? They give out their voice against the cities of Judah. Judah. Now, a lot of people think, well, watchers are bad well, no, the first watchers were that fell. Nobody ever thinks that, okay, the Lord replaced them. Yes, he most absolutely did replace them. We can see that later on in the Bible. He replaced them. See, the first watchers fell. They were terrible, bad, and he replaced them. They're, 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 we don't know. We, there are countless numbers of angels up there. Remember, only one-third fell, and only 200 that made the oath on Mount Hermon were the ones that were considered the fallen angels who made it with women. But then there are more watchers. There are more. I want to go to the book of Joel so that you can see something. It says this, Joel 2.1, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm in my holy mountain. First of all, they're sounding the alarm in Zion, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh. For it is not hand, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, and morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong there had not been ever the like, neither shall there be any more, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. And the land is of the, as a garden of Eden before them, and behind them desolate, a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. I want you to remember this. Nothing shall escape them. That means if they run away, nothing shall escape them. Because this same statement, this same description of this army is also used in the book of Jeremiah. 
The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains, shall they leap like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. Before their faces people shall be much pained. All their faces shall gather blackness. That's also in the book of Jeremiah. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march every one in his own ways and they shall not break the ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. And when they fall upon the sword... You shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city and shall run up on the wall and they shall climb upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. That's also in the book of Jeremiah. They shall w enter into the windows as a thief. They shall climb upon the walls. That's in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, the earth shall quake before them. That's also a notable term. The heavens shall tremble. That's a notable term. The sun and the moon will be dark and the stars shall withdraw the shining. When this army hits... The only time the moon goes dark and the stars withdraw the shining is what? At the day of the Lord. At the day of the Lord. At the day of the Lord. And we just read that the destroyer has been released for the Gentiles to destroy the land. We just heard that the watchers were sent. Okay. And, and, and um, let's continue. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is, a, he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great, very terrible. Who can, who can abide in it? Therefore, also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. And rend your heart, not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for, his, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of evil. That statement, where he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, is also in the book of what? Jeremiah describing the Lord. See, we get the details in the book of Jeremiah, but you have to place it in the context of that time. You have to listen for the instructions of the Lord to see when it applies. And it has to be discerned spiritually. I'll make an example. The daughter of Zion are those who learn the ways of Zion. Right? Because often in the Bible there was a statement made that says, so, uh, so is the so is the mother, then like the daughter, right? In other words, if you're a daughter of something, you have adopted and have learned the ways of the mother. If you're a virgin daughter, if you're a virgin daughter, that's something different. So we have a daughter and a virgin daughter, two different things. Folks, we're going to take a break. I'll be right. I'll be right back. Hang on to your seatbelts. This could get, be a big uh, bumpy. I'll be right back. Okay, folks, we're back. We tried to do something, but somehow we're going to have to get the guy. Yeah, we had, we had sound issues, and we're going to get that done, because I want you guys to hear one of the most anointed. I, I don't know what to, what to call it. I mean, it's just, it penetrates you. And it's J.S. Jimmy. He's going to have to do one live. That's just all it is to it. We're going to get that recording done, and Mike, if you're out there, the recording keeps stopping. But guys, when you hear his music, you, you can... Uh, it really goes through you. It speaks to you on a, an entirely different level. Um, so Mike, we got to get that going. Yeah, it is. It's, it's cutting up. So we have to get that going. That's all right. I'll just snag him live in here. But anyway, we'll take another break in a minute. Hopefully, we'll have something ready. As we read through the book of Joel, not, not to, we're, we're not trying to conform scriptures to paint a picture. We're gathering up God's scriptures. And they absolutely, they begin to match up. But the important thing here to remember is that there hovers over the land's good promises and the Lord's anger which is not turned away until everything is over his anger is not turned away until his indignation is completed and in Jeremiah chapter 4 we see somewhat of an outline we see the confusion in the land that the prophets will wonder 
they'll wonder because of the destruction of Jerusalem. They're not going to understand. The earth is going to mourn, and the heavens will be black. That's Jeremiah 4.28. Jeremiah 4.28. So we can see that these things are, are incredibly so strong, but you may ask yourself, why in the world would the Lord do that? Most people should ask themselves, why in the world, when they read Revelation, would God allow the holy city to be trampled underfoot for 40 and two months? Why would he do that? Why would he do that? But see, now is time to get some things in context according to God's Word. We can have wishful thinking all day, right? We can hope that we're saved without Jesus Christ. That's not going to work. The Lord gave us a way. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one goes to the Father but by Him. So we can hope and wish a different way exists all over the place. It's not going to happen. We have a loving Father. We're privileged because we can call him Father. But the Father's ways are intact. They do work. His ways are completed. His words will come to pass. He's not going to change them nor withdraw them. And there's only one way to him is through Jesus Christ and what his prophecies will not fail that means what he said will come to pass if we look at America we have both good and evil people in America America needs a touch its people need a touch people do pray for the governments people pray for the governments people pray for the leadership they do but it's in bad shape. You don't know what America does in secret. You do not know. You would cry if you understood the depth of forcefulness exercised in this nation. But America does not define you it doesn't define you. And you know what a call went out? A call went out in the Bible that said, Come out of her, my people. Come out of her, my people, that you do not partake of her plagues. That you do not partake of her plagues. You know what that tells me? That tells me the areas, this Babylon that God was talking about, Revelation, is absolutely 100% going to fail because it's already written. It's not going to change but it will have destruction. And I'm telling you now that reading through the book of Jeremiah, Israel was a first fruits unto God. First fruits under God. And when the people got into the land, they did what? They defiled it. They defiled it. Sound familiar? Doesn't that sound familiar? God prepared a place for them and they took the place that God prepared for them and they defiled it. You see, that stretches, you know, that's, that's much more than a nation. How many things has God given us, has he prepared for us? And we stepped into it being thankful at first. But our thankfulness only lasted a little while. And we saw ourselves as so taken care of, we began to boast and look within ourselves and said... I'm going to trust in my own substance here. Folks, we see a pattern of what's happening to the people now. That yesterday, I told you, in Egypt, something happened to the people. That something that happened to the people repeats itself over and over and over and over again. Over and over again. Israel began to trust in its own beauty. It did. Trust it in its own beauty. In fact, 
If you read Ezekiel 16, you'll see exactly why, what she did, how she was raised. You see, God sanctified that land. That land was holy. It was prepared. She stepped into it. The occupant stepped into it. Having been delivered from Egypt, stepped into it and defiled it. Still practicing the ways of the Egyptians in the land that God gave them. Please hear me. How many times do we step into the blessings or prepared places of our Father? And then we defile it by bringing old luggage and baggage into the situation. How many people have moved into a house and then you said, Lord, this house is, this, this is it. I'm going to serve you in this house. And you tell him, I'm going to serve you with this or that. And you're appreciative of it. Then a year later, you find yourself defiling it. Things begin to go wrong. A darkness begins to hover. I'm speaking truthful because it happens. How far are we from the descriptions we see in Jerusalem and Judah? Honestly, are we that distant from the descriptions of Jerusalem and Judah? Thank God for Jesus Christ. Thank God for Jesus Christ. Thank God. You see, we couldn't make it without Him. Most people take their salvation for granted. I, for one, do not take it for granted. Because I'm mindful of these things. When I read these things, it pierces me in the heart. It does pierce me in the heart. We see God's attitude concerning those who turn away from Him. We do. We see it. God said He was pained. He was pained. He was pained. He had pain in His heart concerning those people concerning what they did concerning what he's going to do you know something tells me he doesn't really want anybody to perish in his wrath now there are those who have absolutely turned against him that were never with him they are not seeds of his but there are those of us who are mingled in with them and some of us who have grafted ourselves into the negative seeds in this world, the seeds of Satan, we too will perish. We're going to perish. I don't think he likes to see that. Because it pained him. It pained him. He said, for my people are foolish. They have not known me. They're Scottish children. They have none understanding. They're wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. This same description is also happening in the body of Christ. You see, there are real wolves in the body of Christ. Real wolves in the body of Christ. Wolves that do all manner of things. And you can always tell them by their fruit. No good thing can produce good fruit. No good thing. Jesus said you will know them by their fruit. You'll know them by their fruit. You will absolutely know them by their fruit. You're not going to know them any other way than by their fruit. Jesus said you will know them by their fruit. The Bible says you'll know them by their fruit. Now be cautioned. i got to make a little note here while we're talking about wolves. Be cautioned. The Lord often has pre-selected vessels of himself pre-selected vessels that do horrible things in the beginnings. You know who comes to mind? Uh, Saul, who was in, called Paul. Read Acts 9, 10 through 13. This is why it's very dangerous to point fingers. It's extremely dangerous to point fingers because you don't know who you're pointing at. Now, this guy was giving orders absolutely against the saints of the most time giving orders of persecution against them. He posed them, stood against them. You know what the Lord said? Ah, 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 that is my appointed vessel. 
and his mind. In fact, he sent someone to him in Acts 9. But see, the more we point, and we have no knowledge, God's knowledge of who's appointed and who's not, we get ourselves in trouble, and that was Ananias was given the vision. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And he hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered the Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he had done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. You see that? Did Ananias know who he was? He heard his reputation. He was an evil man. But he did not know who he was. That's why it's not good to point past judgment before the time. Because we don't know what we're doing. We don't have the complete knowledge yet. We don't know what we're doing. Now the Bible said you will know a wolf. You'll know a false teacher, a false prophet by their fruit. But how quick are we to point the finger at anyone? You know what comes to mind? What we just read in uh, Jeremiah. What we just read in Jeremiah comes to mind. It really comes to mind. You see, because we have a hard time doing the good things. But we have no hard time doing the evil. He said, my people are foolish, for they have not known me. They're Scottish children. They have none understanding. They're wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. That's what comes to mind. To do good, they have no knowledge. But they are wise to do evil. That's what comes to mind. We can't be that way. Can't be that way. We see demonstrations of that over and over again. We see people toying with the salvation. Let me not get off topic. I get sincere when I see people toying, but you know what? There is the destroyer is released to the Gentiles. You know what else was called the destroyer? Not to jump off topics, but there is a thing called the destroyer of worlds. It was described. Its appearance was described. Its effects were described all around the world. And it looked like two snakes swimming within each other. The center was black. And when men began to see it, the skies began to turn dark. It pierced the clouds and burned them up. Red dust covered everything. Men could not breathe. Men had to go into the caves because they could not breathe. The water began to boil. Vapors began to rise. The beaches were poisoned. The land was poisoned. They had to go deep underground upon its arrival. But it looked like it was not solid. But constantly it looked like two fiery snakes swimming within each other. With a very dark, dark center. And it brought with it a lot of heat. Vitrification happened to the rocks. The tops of the rocks turned into glass from the heat. The only safe place was deep inside the earth. That's the only safe place. The heat would essentially burn up everything else. The red dust was poison. People couldn't breathe. They were poisoned by the air. The air became poisoned. The fish in the sea began to die. The animals died. The plant life withdrew. Seasons changed. Mountains were moved out of their places. Do you know that's documented? Mountains 
were seen within the matter of hours to rise up from the land straight into the air. Now that seems wild and fanciful, but the only problem is some of the mountain structures make absolutely no sense. They seem as though they rose overnight. How can the top of a mountain, the life within the rock at the top of a mountain, how can it have life at the top of the mountain? Carbon dating, that same specific ratio of that life all the way down. How can that happen? You, you, you can't do that. By the way, they don't use carbon dating anymore. That's, for, that's a civilian term, just equating that to something. And when it comes back again, and when it comes back again, when it comes back again, the effects will be felt. There's a, there's a, they, they documented the effects, the weather phenomena, the earth vibrating, causing earthquakes every single day. The sun, its rays changed. The earth became a little dry. People, I, you know what a long time ago I told you about, people with the magnetic field, listen, if the magnetic field is lost, people will revert back to an animalistic behavior. Without the Earth's mag uh, magnetosphere, your neurological connections in your head will break. You become an animal again. You can't use your frontal lobe. You can't use your reasoning centers. You'll have no reasoning centers. Isn't that awful? By the way, we're talking about Mystery Babylon, the great mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. Mystery Babylon. Can I read something to you in 18, chapter 18? And this is, this is what we're going to cover next. But I need to read 18. Please take notes when I say point that out. Okay. 18. And after, I, after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mildly with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a habitation of devils, and a hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk the wine of wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have waxed, are rat, waxed rich, through the abundance of her delicacies. Let me stop right there. Can I stop right there? You guys make a note of one through three. I'm going to read something to you. Can I read something else to you? I love doing this. I do like doing this. We're going to go to Isaiah 41 or 47 1. Can you guys click to Isaiah 47 1? Now, all of this has to do with, uh, with Jeremiah. So just hang with me. I'm a spontaneous guy, so I kind of throw stuff out there. It says in Isaiah 47 1, come down and sit in the dust. O virgin daughter of Babylon. Notice, notice it says, come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. It didn't say Babylon. It said virgin daughter of Babylon. Okay? Then it said, sit on the ground. There's no throne. O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Stop the press. Since when does God call Babylon Tender and delicate. Has he ever called Babylon tender and delicate? Nope. But he called one place tender and delicate. One place was called tender and delicate. One place. That's why he called it, O virgin daughter of Babylon. And then he said, O daughter of the Chaldeans. He had a problem with Judah and Jerusalem, didn't he? And so why name two people, O virgin daughter of Babylon, an old daughter of the Chaldeans. How many know that Israel was absolutely exiled to Babylon? Here's what people don't know. They were exiled to Babylon and people say, ooh, that was harsh because of King Nebuchadnezzar. Well, he didn't last long. Remember, we read the book of Daniel. He didn't last long. Right? He didn't last long. And do you not know that the people that were exiled there, they became rich? And in the deserts, prophets were born. Things flourished in Babylon. The Jews that were exiled there 
began to rent. They ran institutions. They prospered. How many know that? How many know that? They absolutely prospered. It wasn't as bad as what most people make it out to be. And this is why God was very specific when he said what was corrupted when they went there. Now listen. For thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Can you go with me to, uh, let's see, what it, Jeremiah 6 2. Can you go with me to Jeremiah 6 2? Someone, just anybody. You can go with me to Jeremiah 6 2. Somebody can. Jeremiah 6 2. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. Hmm. You know what comely means? Tender. What was just said? What was just said? What was just said in the book of Isaiah? Tender and delicate. Right? Tender and delicate. Do you know what comely means? That means tender. Who is he talking about? Old daughter of Babylon. Old daughter. Old virgin daughter of Babylon. Old daughter of the Chaldeans. Who is he talking to? Because he's not going to call Babylon tender and delicate. Let me tell you what happened. If they were exiled to a place that was prophesied, God knew exactly they would pick up and adapt themselves to the practices of the Babylonians. Which is exactly what they did. Because they began to bring defiled books and texts and everything else. There was an effective split after their exile. After they returned home from Babylon. After they went home from the tumult, the, the uh, uh, atonement. Yes. But not only that. Do you, how many know that they were sacrificing their sons and daughters? Killing them. How many know that that practice went all the way up to the 1970s? How many? How many know this? I mean, I'd just hate to break it on you, but they were doing these evil things. But God still loves them. Don't point your finger at him. God still loves them. You see, strange things happen, and we'll cover all this in the book of Jeremiah, because we're going to intently look into the As, as we go chapter to chapter, it's going to get uh, a little more intimate. More intimate. But what I'm telling you is this. This mystery Babylon figure that sits atop the beast, what did the Lord say? He, he sat there and he said something about Israel. He said something specifically about Israel. Something specifically. Something to the effect of your lovers are going to hate you. He also went so far as to say your lovers are going to make you naked. They're going to expose you. He did say that. He also said concerning Judah and Jerusalem, the voice of the bridegroom will be heard no more in thee. Hmm. There will be no laughing, no cheering. He also said that Judah will be desolate and a den of dragons. Jeremiah 10.22. Isn't that sounding like what we're just reading in 18? All right, let's continue reading. We're in Revelation. Revelation. I heard another voice from heaven saying come out of her my people that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues let me ask you a question what was his people doing in this place in the first place so what happens here folks what happens here and I heard another voice of heaven saying come out of her my people that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues what happens here you have to ask yourself what happens here do you know the same cry went out? Because do you know what happened to Babylon after, you know, after the uh, Jew, Jews left? Do you know what happened? You know what happened? Persia. That's what happened. Persia happened. Right? Persia happened. Persia happened. Because King Nebuchadnezzar failed, the son took over, and then the, then the uh, Persians ultimately stepped in there. Right? We see that, all that stuff, and in, in, uh, even the warning that Nebuchadnezzar had, right? Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. That was the explanation. It said, you are weighed in the scales and found wanting. That was Daniel 5, 26 through 28. So we see the Lord talking in both... Uh, Past tense, present tense, and future tense. We see the story unfolding of Israel. That's why it carries on to the Old Testament. But here's a confusing part. A lot of people will never, ever 
admit that Mystery Babylon, the great mother of harlots, the first harlot, right? Who was first married to God? Who was first married to God? Was it not the inhabitants of Israel? We just read that he called him his wife, right? He called him his wife. And in order to be a mother of harlots, you have to be the original one. And the Lord called uh, Jerusalem and, and Judah whores, right? He said, I was married to you. You committed adultery and fornicate and all this stuff. That's, that's a way to say you've turned your back on me. I chose you. I married you and you turned your back on me. So when it says the, the, the great mother of harlots, that's what it's saying. They turn their back on something. Why would they be called the great mother of harlots? Why so much attention? Listen, and this is so funny. It says, The beast that thou sawest was and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. They that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life and the foundation of the world. Oops, I made a mistake. Let's go to seven. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee of the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her. So, listen, a beast is carrying this woman in the vision, okay? The beast is carrying this woman. I needed to get that clear. The beast is carrying this woman around, okay? She's carrying this woman around. Then it gives a description of the, of the things that are carrying her, right? The seven heads and, 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 and um, the horns. And the ten, ten crowns. And the waters, of course, which are the many peoples and multitudes and nations of which the beast came out of. Listen, uh, Revelation 17, 16 is very revealing. Here it comes. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. It's very important that you know, eat her flesh that's one you have to note. Eat her flesh. They're going to make her desolate and naked. And they're going to burn her with fire. That's very important for you to know. Very important. These are part of God's prophecies. These are part of God's prophecies. Part of his purging. But it's far more expansive than what you may think. So you can't say, yep, Israel is just terrible and bad and that's what that's what's going to happen to her or you can't say yep America's just awful and bad and that's what's going to happen to it because the Lord has already defined this woman the Lord defined this woman it says a woman which thou saw is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth she reigneth over now that kind of throws a lot of people off if they do not complete reading Jeremiah. They have to complete reading Jeremiah. They have to complete it. And they also have to complete reading Revelation. Because Revelation 23 and 24 really tells a tale. It really tells a tale. But it also describes, we're going back to Isaiah 47.1. If you want to go back to Isaiah 47, 1, because I have to, have to get this. This is the controversial part that throws people off. Okay. It says, Take a millstone and grind meal, uncover thy locks, and make bare the leg, uncover the thigh. Pass over the rivers. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered. Yea, thy shame shall be seen. And I will take vengeance, and I will not meet you as a man. As for our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel. Sit thou silent, and get thee into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For thou shalt no more be called the Lady of Kingdoms. I was wroth with my... Listen, this is important. I was wroth with my people, this is God speaking, and I have polluted mine inheritance, and given them into thine hand. He gave them into their hand. And, and thou didst show no mercy... Upon the ancient hast thou very heavily laid thy yoke. I'm going to read that one more time. I was wroth with my people. I have polluted mine inheritance and given them into thine hand. He gave, he exiled them, 
He exiled them. Understand this. He exiled them. I have polluted mine inheritance and given them into thine hand, given them into your hand, into your country. Thou didn't show them no mercy. They didn't show them any mercy. It's a, it's a, it's a semicolon there. Upon the ancient hast thou very heavily laid thy yoke. And thou saidest, I shall be a lady forever, so that thou didst not lay these things to thy heart. Neither didst thou remember the latter end of it. They didn't consider anything. But the important part here is, God said he sent them to that country. He took responsibility saying, I have polluted my inheritance. I gave them into thine hands. And but you laid a heavy yoke on, on the ancient when he says, upon the ancient hast thou very heavily laid a yoke, he's referring to himself. When he gave them over to captivity, right? When he gave them over to captivity, the burden was on the Lord because of what happened to the people in captivity. He's speaking of himself. Upon the ancient hast thou very heavily laid a yoke. He's going to talk about that heavy yoke further in the chapters. He'll talk about it over and over again. It broke, broke his heart. Broke the Lord's heart. But his anger was stirred up. See, now, herein lies the problem. He sends them to Babylon and to exile. He didn't send them to Rome because he later speaks about how harsh Rome was at the time that they were preserved for the time after Jesus. But not this time. But he sent them into exile, and what did they do? They prospered. They prospered. Most importantly, they did more and more abominable things. More and more abominable things because they began to worship the same gods, the Sumerian gods, the practices of the Babylonians. They did practice. They did prosper. Do you know some of the Jews just never left? How many know that? They didn't leave. They had it too good there. They had it too good. Right? They had it too good and so the Lord is saying, he was angry, but he was wroth with his people. We read that. I polluted mine inheritance and given them into, a, into thine hand, and thou didst show them no mercy. Upon the ancient hast thou very heavily laid a yoke. And thou saidest, I shall be a lady forever, so that thou didst not lay these things to thine heart, neither didst remember the latter end of it. Therefore, hear now this. Thou that art given to pleasure, that dwellest carelessly, that sayest in thine heart, I am and none else beside thee. I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. But these two things shall come upon thee in a moment one day, the loss of children and widowhood. They shall come upon thee in their perfection for the multitude of thy sorceries. And for the great abundance of thine enchantments, stop the press. Let me show you something. 18, when it's talking about Babylon. Revelation 18, when it's talking about Babylon, keep that last one in mind. You guys ready for this? It says this, 23. And the light of the candle shall shine no more in thee at all, no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all the nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints of all that was slain upon the earth. Can I share something with you? Because by sorceries were the nations deceived. By their sorceries were the nations deceived. Just speaking about Babylon. Now we just read here, we just read here. About the sorceries, did we not? But these two things shall come upon thee in the moment, one day, loss of children, widowhood. They shall come upon thee in their perfection for the multitude of thy sorceries and for the great abundance of thine enchantments. For thou hast trusted in thy wickedness. Thou hast said, none seeth me. Where, oh, stop the press on that. Please stop the press on that. That statement, none for thou hast said. Thou hast trusted in thy wickedness. Thou hast said, none seeth me. Who did God say that to? Who else did God say that to? Didn't he say that to Jerusalem? 
He said, you don't see what they see. Behind. He said, you do not see what they're doing behind closed doors. And then they say in their hearts, none seeth me. None seeth me. That's right. Work in the field. That's right. So what are we looking at here in the, in the, in the harlot of Babylon? We're seeing a mixture. See, we're seeing something far different than what we thought. We're seeing something. We're seeing something. Folks, it goes a lot deeper because I'm telling you now, the clothing that this harlot is wearing, whew, and, and it breaks my heart to say so, but they are people that were once in the body of Christ. You cannot be an adulterer unless you're already married. That's what the Lord is talking about. The abominations of the earth, how they were made rich through her delicacies. Folks, we're getting to something so very important. So very important. Then uh, 47, 11, Isaiah 47, 11, Therefore shall evil come upon thee. Thou shalt not know, listen, thou shalt not know from whence it riseth. And mischief shall fall upon thee. Thou shalt not be able to put it off. And desolation shall come upon thee suddenly, which thou shalt not know. Which thou shalt not know. Now this part is a, it sounds, th this part ought to open your eyes. Stand now with thine enchantments and with thy multitude of sorceries wherein thou hast labored from thy youth? If so, be thou shalt be able to profit. If so, be thou, be thou mayest prevail. Thou art wearied in the multitude of counsels. Let, here's a statement. Oh, let now the astrologers and the stargazers and the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from the things that shall come upon thee. Behold, they shall stumble, and fire shall burn them, and they shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm at, nor fire to sit before it. Thus shall they be unto thee, whom thou hast labored. Even thy merchants from thy youth, they shall wander every one to his quarter. None shall save thee. Now we just, we see that in Revelation where it says, the merchants of the earth, they cry, alas, alas, that great city. Babylon has fallen and the smoke is rising up and everything else, she's all messed up. Let me give you a hint. These people hate Babylon. Why are they rejoicing? Why are they crying with tears and rejoicing, saying she's gone, she's gone? And then the Lord says, And the voice of the harpers and the musicians and the pipers and the trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. Here it comes. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. Who, what was that statement written to about the bridegroom and the bride? The bridegroom and the bride. Oh, Jeremiah. That's right. In the book of Jeremiah, that same statement was made in the book of Jeremiah. Isn't that something? In the book of Jeremiah, that same statement is made. So what we're seeing here, folks, is a mixture. This woman that sits atop the beast and the beast hates her, we're seeing a mixture. And I'm telling you now, some of your fallen brothers and sisters are part of this whore. Previously married, selected by God, turning her back and joining in one accord. You see, she rides atop the beast that is made of many people, and so is this abomination of the earth riding and she is many people and they shall hate her and they shall make her naked and desolate and burn her with fire and eat her flesh this is the doom of those brothers and sisters who turn their backs on God they turn their backs 
Now, the importance of Jeremiah and reading about their captivity and their prophecies concerning Israel is this. They went to these lands and they adopted the ways of the lands that they were in. They did not stay fast to the words of God. They even altered his calendar, of which people use today because it's mixed with Babylonian mushgush. How many know that? And do you not, not know that they still perpetuate it? You know what? There are good people in Israel. I'm telling you now that people do not constitute, constitute the reputation of who's governing that nation. You certainly do not constitute, or, or, or you're not worthy of a reputation that the White House gets because of its leadership. You are not worthy of that reputation, which means you will never be pointed out and say, well, you just like the White House. In other words, you're the people in this nation, but you do not have the reputation of your leadership. Do you understand that? The people in Israel do not have the reputation of its leadership. But God is telling us right now that the leadership of that nation who call themselves his people, have done a bad thing. They've done very bad. That's why God said, come out of her, my people. Where are his people? His people are everywhere. Come out of her, my people, that you do not partake of her plagues. He gives us a hint in the New Testament to love the world and to have enmity with God. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and mammon. He gives us hint after hint after hint. They came out of Egypt delivered totally free, but they bought Egypt with them into the new land, defiling it, the first fruits of God, a holy land. They defiled it, and they ruined his heritage. The word of God is so very important because we see the same practices we see the same patterns taking place in our lives. And if we are not learned to understand what the truth is in this word, we're going to be living the same thing over and over again in a state of confusion, saying, God, what is happening to me? Just like they did. Even the prophets were confused. The prophets were confused. Even Jeremiah said, Surely, Lord, you have deceived greatly these people and told them they would have peace. We're going to get to that. Because the Lord spoke no peace. He gave them a promise. He said, If you do this, I'll do this. And they didn't do it. They just didn't do it. Also, also, I'm telling you now that uh, we are grafted into the branch. Don't read this like you're not connected to it. Don't go through these studies and say, well, I'm not connected. I'm not connected to them. They did that a long time ago. I'm not connected to them. Don't you do it. Don't you do it. Because you are. You're grafted into the branch. Grafted. I'm, I'm shocked to use that word grafted because grafting skin, you don't take the skin off when you want to. You're part of that. And you know your skin is the largest uh, organ that you have in your body. How many know that? Your skin is an actual organ. And so if you graft in the skin, the skin, that skin you grafted in becomes part of the organ. You can no longer separate it. It may look a little different, but you can't separate it. You can't. It becomes part of it. You, too, are God's people. God's people. Which means he's looking at, he's always looking at you. He looked at Israel and its people. He knew their condition. And you know what? The whole world is going to suffer. Do you know why? Because of the delicacies of his people who turned their back. Let me tell you something. Had Israel straightened up, had Israel turned to God in full, God would have turned and both protected Israel and purged this entire planet a long time ago. But they didn't do it. They did not do it. And even to this day, Israel is the time peace. America is not the time peace. Africa is not the time peace. Russia is not the time peace. Israel is the time peace. Israel will remain the time peace. And if Israel is the time peace, and the condition of the people of Israel whose hearts are towards God and he's watching them is a time peace, then so are you. You are too. You're a timepiece, too. You're a timepiece, too. 
You see, God gave them a promise. I believe it's uh, Jeremiah 15. Jeremiah 15, God gave them a promise. And yes, I have gone through the whole book of Jeremiah a few times. But God gave them a promise. Is it 15 or 14? could be 14 or 16. It's one of those books. The Lord gave them a promise if they would turn back into him, how he would heal that land, but they didn't. And so part of them became this harlot. And may I remind you, in the Bible, in Revelation, the holy city is trampled underfoot for 40 and two months. Do you know that's in the book of Jeremiah? The holy city. Who is she trampled underfoot from? The beast. Who's riding atop the beast? Mystery Babylon. This, this great harlot, right? And, and what, are the, what does the beast think about her? And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast. These shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked. They'll make her desolate and naked. Desolate and naked. You know who else is going to be desolate and naked by her enemies? Jerusalem and Judah. And what did Jesus say? Those in Judea flee to the mountains. Oh, you know what else they're going to do? We're going to learn in Jeremiah. I'm running out of time. They're going to, you're going to learn in Jeremiah that someone placed an abomination in the holy temple where the Lord chooses to put his name. You're going to learn this. Someone was assisting the beast. You see, the beast can enter anybody. The beast can enter anybody. But there's wicked people all over the place. And if you're reading the book of Daniel, you'll hear a crazy statement. These, they'll, they'll sit at one table and lie to one another. Then one of them leaves and they will come back with intelligence against the Holy Covenant, even the Prince of the Covenant. And they'll take it over. They're going to prosper and take it over. That's the beast. It's the beast. It's the beast. Here's another pattern you need to remember concerning the United States of America. Just as God delivered a people to a prepared land, so did people come here to a prepared land. And I say it's prepared for my knowledge. This verse gets strange. Let me explain something to you about the United States of America. Very few people know exactly what the United States was in the time of Daniel, in the time of Jeremiah. Very few people understand what it was in the time of Moses after the flood. Do you not know that America was a fortress of the Nephilim? It was a fortress of the Nephilim. Here's a mystery nobody can figure out. After the great flood, which is documented, government knows it, after the great flood, there were empires here from the Nephilim. But something took them out. Something took them out. Do you guys understand that? Something took them out here in America. As I talk through the course of days, as God permits, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you some. I'm going to give you something tangible. Because there are certain things I need to prove to you, so you can go see it yourself. You see, a lot of things are in plain sight. I'm not talking about men's architecture. There are a lot of things in plain sight. Just like it says the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. The mother means the first one. She's the first one of harlots. Of all the other harlots, she's the mother of them. Just like that was hidden in plain sight. So are a lot of things in America. This was a Nephilim empire. America was, let me tell you what they did. They, they had an operation a long time ago, and they decided if we don't collect these bones, bones from everywhere, <clears throat> people are not going to believe a lot of things. Now, they initially did it out of protection so people wouldn't have fear because they were still, you know, they learned things from Indians. And the Indians were telling them about the stories. There were sightings back then of the giants. They had encounters. They would run up and take an entire horse and run away with the horse under their arm. They had stories like that. Okay, that's what, that's what the United States was. 
Let me, let me tell you something. God had to prepare this land before America got here. Can I tell you that? He had to prepare it. And then he sent the people over here. They came with a pure heart over here. They wanted to get away from the evil monarchy that was overseas. And they wanted God's word established in this nation. And you know what they did? They came to a prepared land. And they turned away from the truth of God. That's why nothing has worked. Because they turned their backs on the word of God. The Constitution was inspired by the word of God. It's clear. You can go read it yourself. And you know what they did? They amended this and amended that. Saint crept in, made law to amend this, and this amendment only works with the amendments that were made after it that you amend with this one. They have forsaken the covenant. They forsook the covenant. Bad mistake. Did the Lord make a covenant? He must have, or this nation would have fallen a long time ago. And then massive amounts of blood was spilled. What you don't know is some of these people that were killed in the U.S., and it was blood, you don't know what they were because they have to hide the evidence of what they were actually fighting. You don't know about the cases of the possessed soldiers that used to come over here trying to fight. You don't know that the founding fathers hated, listen to me, most of them, they hated prejudice. They wanted all men to be created equally. They knew that all men were created equally. They knew that African Americans were in the line of the Hebrews. How many know most of the Hebrews that you see are either Native American or black? They're, they're called Hebrews. Ever since they started doing this, geneticists, uh, geneticists started tampering with this. They found that fact out. Oops! The first humans must have been African American from Africa. And then something happened. All right? Hebrews were dark-skinned. Egyptians were dark. They kind of look like the people from India who've been in the sun or, or Australia is more like it, some of the imagery. But they were quite be they were beautiful people. And then they had their, their mixtures. But most of the Egyptians that were royalty had these humongous skulls because the first pharaohs were Nephilim. And then the other pharaohs, they tried to keep them in the line of Nephilim. Most of your leaders today come from a Nephilim line. How many know that? That's why the average person just can't be a president. They have to be in the line of the royalty. And the royalty only comes through the Egyptians. Well, basically, it stems from the fallen angels. You have to be in the line of the fallen angels in order to rule anything in this earth. Oh, and by the way, the reason why they formed America, they were trying to get away from a monarchy. And they believed that their, their leadership, one person, king or queen, was selected by God, God's voice on this earth. They tried to get away from that. They said, no, that's not what the Bible teaches. And so they created America getting away from all that. And here comes the devil creeping in. Well, you've got to add a little Babylonian philosophy in there, a little Grecian philosophy, a little this, a little that. They corrupted. Do, do you not know that the Masons actually began as a good organization and then it just went haywire from there? Satan totally took over. He gets us through fascinations and curiosities. That's what he gets us to. But the same pattern has happened here. This was a prepared land. We came here and occupied here. We read the Bible. We raised it. Do you know it was, a, it was a fact that the Bible had to be in every college so that people would have the understanding of the Word of God? Do you understand that? that? That was what happened in the beginnings of this nation that they don't tell anybody about. And then what happened? Same thing that happened to Israel. You want to know what happened to Israel, why they have to be trampled 42, uh, uh, 42 months? Look at America. Look at the corruption in America. Now, America is about 3,000 times worse than anything Israel could ever do. But you just look at America. Because let me submit to you something. Any time you do not walk the way of the Father, there's only one other way you can walk. And that's the way of darkness. There is no other walk. You're walking with the Father or you're walking in darkness. There's no other way you can walk. 
one way or the other, your steps are going to be influenced. You make the choice of who influences your steps. That's why it says, choose ye this day whom ye will serve. By the way, that counts for every single day of your life, every moment of your life, every decision of your life. Who are you serving it with? Who do you stand with? What kingdom do you proclaim? What kingdom? You know, now is the time as we read through the book of Jeremiah and the knowledge is given out and we begin to see all these things, all these comparisons, what the Lord is saying. If it does not make you be sober at the end of this study, I have failed. I, I failed to convey what the Lord gave to me. If you don't look harder into the words of Jeremiah, consider even your own household, your own vessel. Then... I didn't do something right. I didn't convey it right. And I pray to my Father in heaven, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that someone out there can capture this study and make adjustments accordingly. Make adjustments accordingly. Because the Lord's heart was absolutely broken. Broken. Over what Israel did. And what came about. You see, God didn't just see the moment. But he sees the moment and the next day and the next day and the next day until eternity. Of course, his heart was broken. We can only see in the day. God sees all time. He sees the past. He sees the present. He sees the future. Because he dwells in all three all the time. And in other places, we don't understand. We just deal with this day. That's why we can't lie to him. He's already walked and lived in the future. He's in all places at one time. He is in your past, your present right now, and in the future. Time does not exist for him. Time was given to mankind that we may consider and reflect upon our lives to consider him. Time was given to us. Our physics are for us. And like the twisted children we are, but scientists, we explore time. And then we cause the study of the study of time to be a deity where people worship it and devote their lives to studying what? A piece of time. Every advancement mankind has ever made, was it for the betterment of mankind or is it slowly destroying them, consuming them? Everything we create has caused covetousness and a host of things. I use things as tools. But how many of us covet what we get? We get a car. No, you can't touch that spot right there. I just waxed it. We get furniture in our home. So you can't sit right there. This is our special furniture. Or you can't eat off these plates. These plates are special. Can I tell you something? If you cannot serve the Lord your God with your substance, get rid of it. If you can't do a good thing with your substance, get rid of it. Because it's, what it's doing is it's corrupting you. And I know that breaks God's heart. If you have something in your home that's corrupting you, then what you're doing is you're hurting the Father all over again. It grieved him that he made man. His bowels, his heart pained over Israel. We have luxuries unspoken of in the modern world. We have the freedom to praise our Lord. No one's restricting us right now. Why don't we use this freedom to be real, absolute, people of virtue, men and women of standards? We need to utilize every day that we're given because your brothers and sisters are out there dying and suffering, being opened up by the knife, chopped to pieces and everything else, yet we sit in luxury with no thought, saying, no harm is coming to me, nothing will touch me. I sit as a queen. I won't be like them. I'm gonna, you know what? We, our thoughts are just like what was written in the Bible. Even our thoughts are just like the scriptures written in the Bible. That's why I continually say people take their salvation for granted. They have made proclamations over themselves that God didn't make. They have stepped above God. And they have said to themselves, I sit as a queen. I will be no widow. I'm not going to have any loss in this, that, and the other. 
and everything is placed above the Lord your God, then you're in real trouble. You think the Lord allows anything to be placed over him? Anybody? I don't think so. I don't think that would work. You think these engraven images that we have that we place above the Lord our God, you think that's good? That's not. Didn't the Lord say, Thou shalt not make thyself any engraven image or any likeness of anything above the earth and the earth or beneath the earth? For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity upon the fathers to the children, to the third, fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy to the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. The Lord is serious about his word. He's very serious. But we have too many idols. We have too many things that we have made with our own hands. We won't repent of the works of our hands. We place things over our brothers and sisters. You put a TV show before helping somebody else out. You feed yourself before wondering if anybody else is hungry. You know, there are times I simply cannot eat. I, I just can't eat because I'm, I'm I, I can't eat because I'm concerned with the knowledge that I have. It disturbs my flesh. It does pain me inside. And I take it very seriously. And we can't toy with our salvation. Because all of us are about to be exposed to things we don't want to be exposed to. You're going to see it. You're grafted into the branch. Yes, the Lord is coming to take his people before his wrath. is. We're not appointed to his wrath. But before his wrath comes, things are going to start breaking down. There will be challenges. Your faith will be tried. There's a storm coming. And anything that is not God, anything based upon that cornerstone, is going to be tried by fire. I'm telling you now. It's not for your destruction if it's burned up. But it's for your full deliverance. But you're going to be tried. You're going to be tried. But we have to be real. We have to be real. We can't toy and play and continue in this. Because one day, it's written in Revelation. It's a time will be no more. That means it's over. It's up. The wrath is coming. The good are accounted for. The number of them that were to be slain under the altar is complete. The days of vengeance is on the way. The destroyer is coming. And it will destroy the lands. We have got to get so serious. We've got to get serious. They have released the terror reports of what they did to the prisoners. The United States, these terror reports, folks, and I'm telling you now, it's going to, listen to me, listen to me closely. Because they, because they released these reports, and they shouldn't have, it's going to do two things. It's going to cause the American citizens to look at their nation in a dark light. It's going to cause the increase of hatred towards this government structure. Many of the Muslims who were once peaceful are going to feel a call to arms who reside in the United States. Because we already have demonstrations and people are already angry. It's going to do nothing more than increase it. When I said you're the last line of defense, I meant that from my heart. The world can't change anything. Only God's children can petition for the Creator Himself who sent the Destroyer to change a thing. You're the last line of defense. You're the last line of defense. Statements like civilian containment, the real. Two years ago I told people, I said, listen, just because things happen slowly, don't ever become immune to the revelations you've been given. That's what happened to Israel, by the way. They became immune to God's word. 
saying, well, we've done this so long and, and so long, we've got to try something new. No, you need to be steadfast. Right now is not the time to alter your ways and step into the world saying, well, maybe they're right because you'll be lost and you'll never come back. There will come a day when people will be lost and never, ever come back. What the nations are doing, they're doing worldwide. Things will not go back to the way they used to be. And we can no longer afford to take for granted our actual salvation. We have power to petition the Father. We can intercede in people's lives. If we become people of integrity, sincere, really loving our brothers and sisters, then we can see a difference. But if we are hypocritical in heart, saying to many yes, if you're in a conversation and you join in with a conversation, you start saying yes to something just for the sake of peace, you're a hypocrite. Now you need to stand firm in your convictions and pray to the Lord God Almighty that your convictions are inspired from Him, from His Word. Now it's time to let the words of Jesus Christ truly abide in you. Because time is not going to be what it used to be. Many, many things will change. People's hearts will fail them. One of the reasons people's hearts are going to fail is because they trust it in their comfort. They said to themselves, this or that could never happen. Folks, I'm telling you today, disaster will form. It's not fear mongering. It's saying that the Word of God is going to come to pass. The Word of God is going to come to pass. If that's fear mongering, well, then I'm a fear monger because His Word is coming to pass. A lot of people said, 35 years ago, time is going to get better, better, better. Look at it. Look outside your window. Look at the news. What do you see? Whether contrived or real, what do you see? This report that's been released, whether it was planned or not, the blowback is coming. It does not matter. If somebody thought it up, if it's an evil deed, what matters is the result of what they just did. And we have to occupy during this time. Folks, I hope the Lord finds all of us doing His work. You are in power to do His work. You're not appointed to His wrath, but the countries of this earth are going to result in destruction as it is written by the Word of God. The destruction of Israel is not for the people who have given their lives to Jesus Christ, nor is it for those who are appointed like vessels, like Acts, uh, uh, Acts 9, 10 through 13. Nor is it for them. If you're appointed as one of his vessels, that time is not for you either. It could be, you know what? We don't know. We don't know who it is. It could be Chuck Hagel. It could be the worst person we ever thought because Saul was crucifying. I, I'm just utterly giving orders against the saints. He was terrible. You would have called him a Muslim or a terrorist. That's what you would have called him. That's what you would have called Saul. Because they had Muslims back in these days, people who practiced things against Christ. You know what they were called? Sadducees and Pharisees. That's what they were called. I tell you that, but the Muslims were called Sadducees and Pharisees. See, it's not a new thing. They just gave it a new name. It's 9.38. I'm going to run. We're going to continue. And we stopped on Jeremiah 4. Go back through Jeremiah 4. Look at those descriptions. I know it's a lot of information, a lot of tie-ins. There, I have a document. I have a lot of notes. I'm going to put them together. Tie-ins is what I mean by this. You know, in Isaiah, in Isaiah 34, and Revelation where it says, The sky rolled together as a scroll. In Isaiah 34, the sky departed, right, like a scroll. That's what I call tie-in or premise or, or a uh, uh, primer. A primer. 
Perma is a key point in two different documents that actually binds them as one. And so you can see how they relate to one another absolutely. That's what I'm doing here with the book of Jeremiah. Because the harlot that sits atop the beast, it, it, it's, it's an expansive thing. It's an expansive thing. It's far more than we thought. It's comprised of many, many people from many, many different places. And it's more about the heart than anything else. That's what it's about. God bless you all for sticking with me in my lack of DJ skills. God bless everybody. I hope you join me tomorrow. I know tomorrow's Wacky Wednesday, but we're still going to go into the book of Jeremiah. I have a feeling that the news is going to be somewhat uh, full of uh, stuff tomorrow, full of uh, reports and potentials. So um, if anything takes place, I'll talk about some of that. But mostly we're getting back into the book of Jeremiah. I don't want to see my brothers and sisters being part of the scarlet. By the way, do you guys know what scarlet is? What it's referred to in the Bible? Scarlet. Sins. Do you know that? Sins. Scarlet. Purple. Scarlet. Sins. Just so you know that. Folks, I'll see you tomorrow. God bless. Stay tuned for the news. It's coming right up. I think we have the uh, newsroom ready. And Pastor Scott, God bless you for your daily. You know you know what? My, my uh, I'll say it. And Jimmy, oh boy, Jimmy. Jimmy, get ready. Can you do that? I'm going to get that um, audio worked out for Jimmy. Is it, is it working, Effie? Is it working? I'm going to try. I'll tell you this. Jimmy has an anointed voice when I first, when I heard him on the show, and I stopped for a moment because I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. Now, if uh, Effie, you can go ahead and, and uh, let's, see if it's, let's see if it's ready. I'm going to play it, folks. Let's see.
That was absolutely. You, you know what? You can hear the authenticity of his voice. You you can just hear it. That that is just phenomenal. I don't know about you guys, but I like it when when that authenticity shows through through somebody's music and even the words requesting himself as a vessel. You, you see, that really gets to me. I don't know what it is. I'm telling you, folks, discernment, if you have a heart of love, you're going to be able to discern true love from another vessel. That means his heart is pointing towards everybody but himself. No doubt he has endured quite a few things because any vessel, any vessel who focuses on other people, they had to be trained to get there. They had to be trained to get there. And, and then they carry this anointing. And other people can feel the passion and the love. But it's a different love, and you can feel it in his music. Even the tones, the keys, are an expression of who he is. And then the words edify the work of our Lord through an individual. That, that's just awesome to me. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's why I like to hear, too, Pastor Scott, when he comes in there and he sings certain songs. It, to me, it's more, it's an authentic thing to hear someone, someone just do that. That's awesome. That's a blessing to me. That really blesses my soul. Folks, I love you. I'm going to let the news people take it over. Hopefully, you'll join me tomorrow. Hopefully, you will. And, uh, Jimmy, you still have to get on my Skype just in case. You know, we have to use that just in case thing. You still have to do a Skype request just in case. Because I might accidentally push a button or something like that. You know, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing back here, but I love it. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. Okay, folks, before I start tearing up, right? Because normally when I start getting in this mode, I begin to, I'm really overwhelmed at what the Lord is doing. I'm really overwhelmed at this family. But I'm absolutely overwhelmed with what I see the Lord doing in the lives of people here. And how it's touched. Because you guys don't know when you participate. You have no idea who you're touching out there in the world. You just see the chat room. You don't know about the other visual tools that we have. You don't know who can see your chats and your interactions. You don't know the people who look at you guys and they know who you are on an individual basis and they look at you rather than TV, and they're listening to COT, they're listening to Pastor Scott, they're listening to Pastor Paul, they're listening to FE. You don't know. Some people watch you guys for hours. I can see it in the logs. They watch it for hours. You guys are being here conversating, one or two together, or something like that. And they're looking. They know who you are. They know your character. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. You bless others when you share both your issues and your recovery. You do, because they see you as authentic. You don't know that they're watching you, so you talk freely amongst each other. And, of course, you'll say, pray for me for this and for that. And they're noticing. They're taking note of your life. You're actually ministering to people by being yourself. All you have to be is yourself, because who you are is 100% beautiful. It's also perfection. Who you are, you're the only one like you, and it is beautiful. Folks, I love you. Thank you, Jimmy, for that song. Folks, God bless you. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to let the news people take it over, and uh, I hope you guys have a blessed, 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 blessed evening. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for you. I thank our Lord and Savior for everything that's happening here. Good night, all. Hey guys, this is Pastor Anthony here with a quick announcement. Uh, for those of you who would like to donate to Council of Time and support the work that Mike has been doing at this ministry, this is your opportunity to do so. Just go to www.councilofthetime.com, click on the donation tab located on the left side of your screen. Once you've clicked on that, it will take you to a secondary page On this page, if you look at the bottom where it says donations for Council of Time, 
you will click on COT operations. Once you click on COT operations, it will bring you to the actual donation page located here. On this page, you can set up your donation through PayPal for a one-time only donation, or you can mark it right here to give monthly a donation to Mike and the COT team. Of course, your donations will go to further the work that COT has to update their equipment and any other needs that they need to sustain their ministry and operations at COT. Once again, we thank you guys so much for being a part of Daily Excellence and for supporting Mike at Council of Time. Now, back to Mike.